Namaste. So Sage Yagnavalkya and Emperor Janaka are having a conversation about light. And what is it about light? Light is necessary to reveal the objects of consciousness, isn't it? Without light, we can't see. Without sound, we can't hear, and so on. So they are discussing the ground of inference, the context of reasoning that leads to the conclusion of the Vedas that the self is the ultimate source of consciousness, knowledge, and, of course, light. When the sun has set, Yagnavalkya, what serves as the light for a man? The moon serves as his light. It is through the light of the moon that he sits, goes out, works, and returns. Just so, Yagnavalkya. When the sun and moon have both set, Yagnavalkya, what serves as a light for a man? The fire serves as his light. It is through the fire that he sits, goes out, works, and returns. Just so, Yagnavalkya. When the sun and the moon have both set and the fire has gone out, Yagnavalkya, what serves as the light for a man? Speech. Sound serves as his light. It is through the light of speech that he sits, goes out, works, and returns. Therefore, O Emperor, even when's own hand, therefore, O Emperor, even when one's own hand is not clearly visible, if a sound is uttered, one manages to go there. Just so, Yagyavalkya. Now, these three verses, and also the previous verse, verse 2, from the last video, which you can see here, are about what happens when these sources of light, or the sources that reveal the objects of consciousness, go away. What happens when the sun sets, when the moon sets, when the light goes out? then there's another source of light. There's another source that reveals the actual objects of consciousness. And why is he going through all these things and then telling about how they cease? Because these lights are material. And being material, they're temporary. In other words, they are unreliable. In certain conditions, certain circumstances, they are good guides for one to sit, go out, work, come back, and do all the activities of ordinary life. But the fact is, all of them are temporary. Even the light of the sun ends when the sun goes down. Or even on a black dark, stormy night. There's no moon. There's no fire. And the fire has gone out. <laughs> fire will burn as long as there's fuel. But when the fuel is exhausted, when you run out of firewood on a dark, stormy night, <laughs> it's pitch black. You can't even see your hand in front of your face. So then what do you do for light? Yagyavalkya replies, speech is the light. Sound, in general, is the light. And Shankaracharya, we'll see, extends this to imply all the other senses can act as a light. When the fire has gone out, speech serves as the light. Speech here means sound. Sound, which is the object of hearing, stimulates the ear, its organ. This gives rise to discrimination in the mind. Through that mind, a man engages in an outward action. Elsewhere, it has been said, 
It is through the mind that one sees and hears. Now, I'm not going to show that other verse because it's deeply embedded in a context and re would require too much explanation. But just take it as a given that in the opinion of the Upanishad, that perception happens through the mind, not directly through the senses. Mark this, because it's very important distinction. Way back in the series on Drig Drishya Vivekaha, it was taught that objects of the material world are the seen, and the senses are the seer. The senses are the seen, and the mind is the seer. The mind is the seen, and intelligence is the seer. Intelligence is the seen, and the self is the seer. So all these things can become the seen as well as the seer, except for the self. And we know from other quotations in the Upanishads that the self is never seen. It is only the seer. It is never the object. It is always the subject. And of course, there's that famous quote, you cannot see the self, you can only be the self. So all of us are the self. We are all Brahman, covered by different upadis, among which are the mind, the senses, the sense organs, you know, the rest of the body and so forth. So then, what is the meaning of this? Well, Shankaracharya goes on. How can speech be called a light? For it is not known to be such. The answer is ging. The answer is being given. Therefore, O emperor, etc. Because a man lives and moves in the world helped by the light of speech, therefore it is a well-known fact that speech serves as a light. How? Even when, as in the rainy season, owing to the darkness created by clouds, generally blotting out all light, one's own hand is not clearly visible, though every activity is then stopped owing to the want of external light. If a sound is uttered, as for instance a dog barks or an ass brays, one manages to go there. That sound acts as a light, and connects the ear with the mind. Thus speech, sound, does the function of a light there. With the help of that sound serving as a light, the man actually goes there, works at that place, and returns. The mention of the light of speech includes odor, etc., for when odor and the rest also help the nose and other organs, a man is induced to act or dissuaded from it, and so on. So they too help the body and organs. Just so, Yagyavalkya. Janaka approves of this line of reasoning. Why? Because it is his intention to extract the esoteric truths about Brahman from the mind of Yagyavalkya. <laughs> so he is creating a context for a certain discussion, and Yagyavalkya understands his intention. So he is also playing along. And because this is in a royal court, we can imagine there must be many other people present. The ministers, other sages, guards, the populace, and so on. So this is a lesson to all of them. And we find many conversations like this in the Vedas, where the real object of the conversation is not to teach or learn the participants in the conversation, but it's almost like a play enacted to enlighten the people who are hearing it, the people who are there present around them. Now, just consider what happens in the dark. For example, let's say it's a dark and stormy night. Huh? 
to make an original quote. <laughs> it's a dark and stormy night and the power goes off. Well, what do you do? You're sitting there in your room, maybe reading or doing whatever, and the lights go out and it's absolutely dark. If you're at home and you know the place, it's a familiar area, you can navigate simply by moving very carefully and avoiding various obstacles and so on. Because you have a picture in your mind, you have a model of what the room is like, the objects it contains and so forth. So maybe you're looking for a candle or a flashlight and to avoid stumbling and tripping over things, maybe you put your hand out uh, and touch various objects that you expect to be there because they're in your mental picture of the layout of the room. So then the mind, memory, serves as a light. So the mind can also be a light because it reveals the objects that one has to either locate or avoid in order to deal with the darkness. See, so light can come from anywhere. It can come from the sun, moon, and so forth, or it can be artificial light, or it can be smell, taste, and touch, or it can be the mind. But ultimately, none of these have any effect without the presence of the self. And so in the next verse, the self is given as the final ultimate light. When the sun and moon have both set, the fire has gone out and speech has stopped, Yogi Valkya, what serves as the light for a man? The self serves as his light. It is through the light of the self that he sits, goes out, works, and returns. Just so, Yagyavalkya. When speech also has stopped, and other external aids too, such as odor, all the activities of the man would stop. The idea is this. When the eyes and other organs, which are outgoing in their tendencies, are helped in the waking state by lights such as the sun, then a man vividly lives and moves in the world. So we see that in the waking state, a light extraneous to his body, which is an aggregate of parts, serves as the light for him. From this, we conclude that when all external light is blotted out in the states of dream and profound sleep, as well as in similar circumstances of the waking state, a light extraneous to his body serves the purpose of a light for him. So now we come to the mention of the other states of consciousness, besides jagrat, or waking consciousness. Because waking consciousness is also temporary. See, all these things are material because they are temporary. They're not actually 100% fully real. They don't really exist. Their existence is conditional. It's tangential to the actual reality. Our conditional existence in this material world requires some external light to reveal what is actually going on so that we can do our work, so that we can know what's going on, where we are, what we have to do or not do, and so on. This is the point, and this is what this whole chain of inference has been leading to. Ultimately, the self is the light because the self is consciousness. The self is conscious and is consciousness. So when the self is present, everything is revealed. When the self is away, looking in the opposite direction or something, then we don't know anything. And so the conversation continues in that vein. We see also that the purpose of a light is served in dreams, as, for instance, meeting and parting from friends, going to other places, etc. 
And we awake from deep sleep with the remembrance that we slept happily and knew nothing. Therefore, there exists some extraneous light. What is that light which acts when speech has stopped? The reply is being given. The self serves as his light. By the word self is meant that light which is different from one's body and organs and illuminates them like the external lights such as the sun, but is itself not illuminated by anything else. So this is where the chain of reasoning ends. It can go no farther because <laughs> he can't go on to ask, well, when the self is not present, then where is the light for a man? See, which would naturally be the next clause or the next formula in the series so far. But remember what we said about linear logic, about induction? You can extrapolate it to a certain point, but then it becomes useless because it's no longer in alignment with the reality. There is never a situation or condition where the self is absent. At the most, the attention of the self can be directed elsewhere, but that's a different thing. The self is still present. Simply, it is looking or occupied with something else. So, for example, when someone is speaking and your mind is on something else, you know, let's say you're scratching a mosquito bite or something. <laughs> and you say, oh, I didn't hear what you said. My mind was distracted. My mind was not present. What it really means is that my attention was directed elsewhere. And so I didn't hear what you said. Or if someone, you know, bumps into an object or a person, and then he says, what's the matter with you? Huh? And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I was distracted. My mind was elsewhere. I was in deep thought or whatever. See, so the attention is what makes the presence of the self known. But to the person, the self is always present. Huh? Wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> to quote a popular saying, I think that was originated by Yogi Berra. <laughs> one of my favorite philosophers. So the self is present everywhere simply because we are the self. Wherever we go, there the self is. Can't get away from it. Even during dreams and deep sleep, we've often remarked that in dream consciousness, svapna, there is no external light like the sun and moon. Yet everything seems illuminated as if they are glowing from within. And this is also the self illuminating the thoughts in the mind. Because dreams are nothing but mental images. And so they're based on remembrance. And that's another instance. When we remember something, for example, the story of the person in the room and the power goes out on a dark night. They remember the layout of the room and the attention of the self illuminates that memory. Even if there's no light in the current environment, they can navigate around the room simply by remembering what the room contains, what shape it's in, where the doors are, where the other objects in the room are. So that memory is brought to the attention by the illumination of the self. I mean, where else is it going to be illumined? And even in deep sleep, one remembers afterward that, oh, I slept and there was nothing. Oh, it was so restful. It was so great. This self is the ultimate light. There is no light that illumines the self. <laughs> the self is self-illumined. The self is always aware. Even when there's no objects, the self is still aware of being aware. This is called Turiya. 
Turiya consciousness is awareness of awareness. And if there are other states of consciousness present, such as Svapna, Sushupti, or Jagrat, one is aware of them through the awareness of the self. This is Turiya, when the only object of consciousness is other states of consciousness, even its own. And there's even a state beyond this when the body's karma is finished and it drops away. And then there's no more senses, no more mind, no more intelligence, because those are all part of the body, the subtle body. So when a person reaches enlightenment, becomes jivan mukta, then all of their karma is finished at the end of the body. And the reason why all the karma is not finished immediately upon attainment of enlightenment is so that there are enlightened teachers in the world to guide others toward this exalted state. So the teachers, the jivan muktas, remain in the world as long as the prarabdha karma, or the karma that is due to fructify in this life, remains. When the prarabdha karma is all used up, discharged, experienced, or enjoyed, then the body drops, and so does the subtle bodies. And all that's left is the self. But the self is still conscious. We're still aware. <laughs> Only it has no objects except itself. This is called Turiyatita. Turiyatita means like the maximum Turiya. Huh? Atita. Turiya is the root or ground state of the self. And it is always with us. We are never without Turiya. Turiya is the native state of the self. In Turiya, there's no personality, there's no mind, there's no intelligence, there's no even consciousness. Because consciousness requires an object. And when the self is all by itself, there are no objects. This is Turiya Tita. So let's get back to the conversation. By the word self is meant that light which is different from one's body and organs and illumines them like the external lights such as the sun, but is itself not illumined by anything else. And on the principle of the residuum, it is inside the body, for it has already been proved that it is different from the body and organs. And we have seen that a light which is different from the body and organs and helps their work is perceived by the organs such as the eye. But the light that we are discussing now, the self, is not perceived by the eye, etc. When lights such as the sun have ceased to work. Since, however, we see that the usual effects of light are there, we conclude it is through the light of the self that he sits, goes out, works, and returns. Therefore, we understand that this light must be inside the body, but it is different from lights such as the sun and immaterial. That is why, unlike the sun, etc., it is not perceived by the eye, and so forth. So, the self and its light are different from the body, but they are in the body. How do we know that? Because they can illuminate the mind and the senses as well. And the mind and senses are in the body. Therefore, the light must be in the body. Because we find that the external lights, like the sun, can only illuminate the objects in the world. They do not illuminate the mind or the senses from within. Only the self does that because the self is conscious and is consciousness. So when the self illuminates the different senses and the mind, then impressions come in 
and they form the information that we process with the mind and intelligence to determine what to do, what not to do, when to act and when not to act and so on like that. So this is the function of the light of the self. And the light of the self, although it's visible to the self, is not visible to the bodily senses. The eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, and so forth cannot sense the presence of the self. But then again, without the presence of the self, these senses become inoperative. For example, at the time of death, when the self abandons the body because it becomes useless, then, or when the karma, the prarabdha karma of the body is used up and it falls away on its own, then the self detaches from the body and at that time the senses fail. Even the mind fails because it's part of the body. That's another whole big subject, what happens at the time of death when the self separates from the body. And where does it go and what does it do? <laughs> That's a big discussion, which is covered, by the way, in the third canto or the third chapter of Vedanta Sutra. Vedanta Sutra is a wonderful book. You should read Shankara's commentary on it. Very enlightening, absolutely essential. So anyway, we will continue in the next video with a discussion of an objection, the materialist's objection. Huh? Because if you have any experience trying to talk about this stuff with your friends or family, <laughs> you've already discovered the fact that most people do not accept the existence of the self. In fact, most people think that consciousness is caused by something material. But that is not a tenable position, and it's very easy to explain why. And we'll find out all of this in the next episode. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Hi Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.